So this recording, we're going to look at drugs to treat some conditions. And the conditions that we're going to look at in terms of drugs managing are schizophrenia, depression, bipolar disorder, anxiety and insomnia, and ADHD. So to start off with, um, this is an overview slide to actually give you a little bit of a background for the understanding underlying the chemical imbalance associated with these um, conditions. So if you see over here, um, in schizophrenia, um, they've identified that um, people with schizophrenia may have too much dopamine, um, whereas um, too little dopamine is involved with um, or is associated with the symptoms of depression and ADHD, as well as Parkinsonism. You can see over here that in depression, there's also found to be um, too little 5-HT or serotonin or and or too little um, norepinephrine. So how does that help us? Well, what it, how it helps us is this. If in schizophrenia it's been identified that um, there is too much dopamine, the answer for drugs to actually manage schizophrenia is to actually block the effects of uh, dopamine. So the diagram on the top right actually gives you that. So you've got um, neurons in the central nervous system that are releasing dopamine, and there's too much dopamine um, released, right? So it's too much. And so the drugs used to manage schizophrenia basically block dopamine receptors. And then if the dopamine receptors are blocked, it's as if that it's as if dopamine um, levels are actually decreased. Okay, so that's how it works. Um, and then in other conditions like depression, where they say that it, it's associated with too little dopamine, 5-HT, and norepinephrine, what happens with those conditions is that the drugs that are given to manage those actually increase the amount of these neurotransmitters in the synaptic cleft. And these neurotransmitters, by the way, are considered monoamines. So when we talk about monoamines, we're talking about dopamine, norepinephrine, and 5-HT. And there's a link um, to a video here, chemical imbalance theory, over there. Now, the problem with managing um, these conditions with drugs is that a lot of the drugs that are used to manage these conditions also have other effects on um, receptors and neurotransmitters. So what I'm saying is that these drugs are not clean drugs. They also affect other receptors. So for example, a, a typical um, antipsychotic used to manage schizophrenia will block dopamine receptors, but will also block histamine receptors, um, acetylcholine receptors, and um, alpha-1 adrenergic receptors. And so as well as managing the symptoms associated with um, uh, manic episodes of schizophrenia, it also can cause adverse effects. So these are the adverse effects. If too much dopamine receptors are blocked, then it cause, causes um, what's called movement disorders that are um, um, categorized together under EPS or extrapyramidal symptoms, and we'll go through that um, in a few slides time. Um, in association with the antihistamine effects, some of these drugs also cause sedation. Right? And because that those drugs also block the acetylcholine muscarinic receptors, it's associated with what's called anti-muscarinic um, effects, which are listed over here. Some of the drugs also blocked alpha-1 adrenergic receptors. And you, if you can remember, alpha-1 adrenergic receptors are found on blood vessels, and they act to uh, vasoconstrict. And so if you block these um, receptors on the blood vessels, they cause vasodilation, and they can lead to orthostatic hypotension. Another um, type of um, antipsychotics um, are called an atypical antipsychotics, and they also work to block 5-HT3 receptors. And what happens when those are blocked is that it has metabolic effects and leads to weight gain. And we're not talking just a couple of, of, of pounds, we're talking about um, 30 pounds, and that would lead to um, Arthrosclerosis would lead to dyslipidemia and obesity, obviously. And then also, if you if you increase the risk of obesity, then you increase the risk of um, diabetes um, occurring. All right. So these are just the the effects, um, and this is an overview. And I'm going to go through each of the five conditions um, in this lecture.
So the first one is schizophrenia. So you've got over here, schizophrenia, the symptoms um, associated with it can be grouped into three categories, positive, negative, and cognitive. Um, and in terms of what the drugs can do is that they can most easily um, help with a positive as well as the negative symptoms. And again, um, an understanding of what these symptoms are will actually help you to understand how the drugs work, but this is not the information in this slide is not directly examinable, examinable as you can see from the, um, from the background of the slide. So just an overview of antipsychotic drugs. Very important to actually um, remember that these drugs only provide symptomatic relief. So it doesn't alter the progression or pathology of the condition. So people with schizophrenia will never be cured, but they can actually be managed. Um, and that is what the three major objectives of drug therapy with antipsychotic drugs is, right? To actually suppress acute episodes, to actually prevent um, future um, exacerbations, and to actually allow that person to actually maintain the highest possible level of functioning, okay? Um, so in, in order to actually meet these three objectives, what happens is that you've got three different phases. So the first phase is an, an initial therapy. So initial therapy are usually used to actually treat acute manic episodes, right? And once that acute manic episodes is um, being um, adequately managed, then we're going to look at maintenance therapy, which serves to actually prevent future acute um, episodes. And then um, with the maintenance therapy, we can also use um, various um, adjunctive uh, drugs um, to actually m ensure um, that the person has the f highest possible um, function possible, um, as well as to prevent any future episodes. In terms of the time course of effects, initial effects take one and two days, um, big improvement take two to four weeks, and it's um, several months before the full effects of the drugs are known. And that's because um, these antipsychotic drugs work in the central nervous system, and part of their mechan mechanism of action is they need to actually um, have some adaptation responses in the CNS um, to actually alter the uh, functioning of central nervous system neurons. In order to encourage um, the patient to actually stick to the uh, uh, drug regime, um, again, you need to actually have perhaps family members overseeing medications for outpatients. Um, and if the uh, patient is an inpatient, again, ensuring that the medication is taken. Um, provide a regular, easy to maintain schedule to increase compliance and to also inform patients about the side effects of the treatment. So again, um, information and education is key so that the patients actually know what's ahead of them. Just some st statistics. Um, three of the um, antipsychotic drugs that we'll talk about, these are all three are considered anti atypical antipsychotics or second generation antipsychotics. They're among the top selling medications of all time in the US and the uh, combined yearly sales of these three drugs are um, are 18.5 billion just in the in the US. So you can see that it's a huge market um, and it's very much in demand. Other considerations for antipsychotics is um, in terms of physical and psychological dependence, it's rare, and um, if the antipsychotics are withdrawn abruptly, it can precipitate a, um, a mild withdrawal or abstinence syndromes, right? Drug interactions, um, again, with these drugs, what happens is it can interact with the antipsychotic drugs to produce unwanted effects. So um, most antipsychotic drugs already have an anticholinergic effect, so you don't want um, to have the, the, the patient have a second or third anticholinergic effect because it can intens intensify those anticholinergic effects. And those anticholinergic effects include dry mouth, uh, blurred vision, constipation, and so on. Antipsychotics um, depress the CNS. So again, taking it with other CNS depressants can intensify that effect. And antipsychotics predominantly um, work as dopamine antagonists. So again, if a person is being given 
um, a dopamine agonist that actually counter counteracts the um, antagonistic effects of the antipsychotics on the dopamine receptors. Overall, conventional antipsychotics are very safe. Death by overdose is rare. Um, and overdose can produce uh, depression, EPS, and um, hypertension. And so these are just some treatment um, strategies. Two, two generations of antipsychotic. First generation antipsychotics are also called typical antipsychotics. Second generations, which we'll talk about in the next slide, are called atypical antipsychotics. So the main mechanism for first-generation antipsychotics is that they strongly block receptors for dopamine in the central nervous system. So these guys are dopamine antagonists. Now it should be noted that most first-generation antipsychotics have uh, similar therapeutic effects, but the individual um, patients may respond and um, develop different um, side effects. And so um, there's a lot of choices with uh, atypical antipsychotics. And so if a patient does not respond well or responds well but has severe side effects with one um, first-generation antipsychotic, it's a, um, it is a possibility to switch to another one, right? First-generation antipsychotics cost less 10% of um, the cost of a second-generation antipsychotic. So it's uh, much cheaper than the second-generation antipsychotics. So therapeutic uses in schizophrenia as well as other uses, right? And it's also used to treat uh, a person who has an um, acute um, episode of uh, uh, mania in bipolar disorder. So um, this is how it works. But as I said, um, these antipsychotics also block other, other receptors. Um, and the effect of both blocking the dopamine receptors can also lead to some of its side effects, right? So blocking of dopamine receptors may actually lead to um, a decrease in the symptoms of mania, but it can also cause extra pyramidal symptoms, which are movement disorders or EPS. Right? It blocks histamine receptors to cause sedation. It blocks cholinergic receptors to cause these, uh, these effects. It blocks um, adrenergic receptors to cause orthostatic hypotension. It can also lead to what's called neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Um, it's a rare but serious uh, reaction and can cause death if, if untreated. And so the neuroleptic uh, malignant syndrome, one of the big things is that it causes autonomic instability. So the autonomic system, nervous system, is your parasympathetic and your sympathetic nervous system. And so it causes an imbalance within those two systems. So it can lead to a depression of the respiratory tract. It can cause dysrhythmias. It can cause fluctuations in blood pressure, right? And that, if left untreated, can actually lead to seizures, coma, and then death. Second generation antipsychotics are also referred to as atypical antipsychotics. And what they do is they provide moderate blockade of um, dopamine receptors. And so if you just lightly block the dopamine receptors, it has it leads to fewer um, extrapyramidal symptoms, but it also blocks the serotonin uh, receptors um, a lot strong, stronger, right? And blocking of the serotonin receptors leads to metabolic effects. I should say that, um, um, sorry, so the therapeutic uses for second generation antipsychotics are for uh, schizophrenia, and then you've got here included in this list is the three um, most prescribed drugs in the U.S., right? There's Zeprexa, Abilify, and Seroquel. Um, and so those are very, very um, um, heavily effect, uh, effective and um, much prescribed, right? And so what happens is second-generation antipsychotics outsell first-generation antipsychotics by a factor of 10. And that's because it treats both positive as well as negative symptoms. And again, to look at what positive and negative symptoms are, you have to go two slides back. Now, as I said, the second-generation antipsychotics block dopamine receptors as well as other receptors. So it blocks dopamine receptors weakly and the and the big 
plus for that, big advantage for that is because it only weakly blocks dopamine receptors, there's less risk of EPS. But it also blocks, like the um, typical antipsychotics, it also blocks um, receptors for histamine, um, alpha-1 adrenergic, and cholinergic receptors. Right. Um, the other thing is that it blocks 5-HT receptors strongly, and so you have an increased risk of weight gain, of um, um, increased risk of obesity, dyslipidemia, as well as diabetes. So that's the uh, um, the negative side of the second generation antipsychotics. Now I talked about extra pyramidal uh, effects, and these are a major major concern. So um, there's four different types of extrapyramidal effects, and what I want you to note is when it actually appears. So acute dystonia can appear within hours or days of the first administration of the um, antipsychotics. Parkinsonism occurs within the first month, acathasia occurs within um, two months, and then tardive dyskinesia occurs, um, appears during long-term therapy, and it's often irreversible. So the first three are, are reversible if the drug is changed or the drug is withdrawn. But the last one is not reversible, um, and so we need to actually watch out for that. The first three can be managed by anticholinergics or by beta blockers. So I'll explain to you the, the logic of why anticholinergics are sometimes used with this. All right. So if you look at the uh, diagram on the right, you can see here this is the uh, normal brain. You've got the substantia nigra, and the substantia nigra contains uh, neurons, the cell bodies of neurons that produce dopamine. Right? And so what happens is these neurons produce dopamine, and the dopamine is released in the striatum. And so what happens is in the normal person, you have a balance. You have the same amount of dopamine and acetylcholine, and that actually leads to controlled movement that we see in um, people um, w without the imbalance. Now, what happens is if there is an imbalance, um, for example, in Parkinson's disease, what happens is the dopamine recept uh, neurons actually are reduced. And so what happens is you have less dopamine, right? So the dopamine um, block is lighter than the acetylcholine, um, and you have more acetylcholine by comparison. Right, relatively speaking, you have more acetylcholine, and so that leads to the disturbed movement that's associated with Parkinson's disease. Right, so in Parkinson's disease, you have decreased dopamine. With antipsychotics, you also have, because of the dopamine antagonists, what happens is the effects of dopamine decrease. So it resembles, or it can resemble, what's going on in Parkinson's disease. Right, and so one of the um, one of the strategies for treatment of these extrapyramidal symptoms is to actually block this um, relatively high levels of acetylcholine using anticholinergics. Right? And so that's the strategy behind that. The strategy behind beta blockers is that um, because it's movement disorders, the beta blockers actually help to reduce the uh, tremors associated with EPS. All right, so with acute dystonia that appears within hours to days, it causes severe spasm of tongue, face, um, and neck. It can, um, the spasm can actually impair respiration and it cause joint dislocation um, within the jaw because of the sp severe spasm. The second type is Parkinsonism, and so you've got effects that are uh, associated with Parkinson's disease. Um, and so you've got the slow movement, mask-like uh, face, drooling, tremor, rigidity, shuffling gait, um, and the stoop gestures. Akathisia is you've got uncontrollable uh, pacing, so pacing, squirming, need to be in motion all the time. So again, this can become down or reduced with anticholinergics. And then the last one, tardive dyskinesia, appears during long-term therapy. So it needs to be monitored every 12 uh, months in the first instance and more frequently after that to ensure that this doesn't appear, right? Because again, it's often irreversible, so you want to prevent the appearance of this and you've got this uh, lip smacking, um, worm-like movements of the tongue and, and face, and that's ca that can be quite disconcerting. 
Moving on, we've got antidepressants. So antidepressants is, uh, sorry, depression is the most common psychiatric dis disorders. The risk of suicide is high. It's often untreated. Um, twice as common in women than in men. Um, and then you've got some stats over here, right? So antidepressants, the drugs, are only primarily used to uh, relieve symptoms of what's called clinical depression. Um, and it can also help people with anxiety um, disorders to actually calm them down. And it's not really indicated for uncomplicated bereavement. So if a person has um, loss of a loved one, um, it's not really recommended for people um, undergoing what's called uncomplicated bereavement um, because hopefully that will resolve by itself over time. So antidepressants treatments, uh, obviously because this is a pharmacology course, um, we will focus mainly on the drugs, pharmacotherapy, and of, of the five um, category of drugs, we will focus on these three. Other uh, treatments, non-pharmacotherapeutic uh, based treatments are psychotherapy, electroconvulsive ther therapy used when a rapid response is needed, so used for elderly patients that are starving, patients that are um, uh, severely depressed or patients that are suicidal, again, to actually jumpstart the whole process. And then you've got uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, vagus nerve stimulation, and light therapy. So again, we won't actually spend uh, any more time on this just to actually um, let you know what the various options for antidepressant uh, treatments are. Basic considerations of uh, antidepressants, again, like the antipsychotics, the symptoms resolve very slowly, right? Initial responses develop after one to three weeks. Maximal responses may not seen um, for three months. Right? Failure when taken one month without success. And this is where um, these three possibilities might actually, um, or actually these two, might actually be used in order to actually jumpstart the treatment. All right. In terms of drug uh, selection, um, the um, chemical basis of depression may lie in a deficiency of monoamines. And monoamines are norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. And so you see what the drug, um, the various drugs used to actually treat depression is to actually increase the effects of norepinephrine, dopamine, um, and serotonin. Right? Um, antidepressants have nearly equal efficacy, but it's really um, which drug actually works for the individual patient. Now, in terms of manage, uh, treatment management, um, suicide rate with antidepressants may actually increase during early treatment, and that's because when people are severely depressed, they may not actually be able to form um, a plan, a suicide plan, whereas when they're on antidepressants, they're actually, um, they're actually um, cognizant enough to actually develop a plan and perhaps follow it through. So again, the risk of suicide is very, very real in uh, people taking, with, taking antidepressants, so the patients need to be observed closely for um, suicide ideation, worsening mood, changes in behavior, in case it does lead to the person actually carrying out um, a suicide um, plan. And so just in order to actually uh, prevent that or to monitor that, um, patients, uh, dosing of patients should be directly observed. And also in terms of outpatient, um, the prescription needs to be made for the smallest amount um, of doses and um, to monitor the patient um, closely. The first group of antidepressants are called tricyclic antidepressants or TCAs. And what happens is this is the first, uh, the drug of first choice. It has long and variable half-life. So again, um, single daily dose is often given and also individualization of dosage is also highly recommended because of the variable um, half-lives. TCAs are involved in blocking neuronal up uptake, reuptake of two monoamine transmitters. All right, so what happens is this. So neurotransmitters are produced by the cell body, transported down the axon, and then released into the synaptic cleft. So you've got the release of these neurotransmitters over here. At some point, these monoamines um, go back into the um, 
uh, neuron through this transport pump over here, right? And so if those neurotransmitters go back into the neurons, that means that there's less neurotransmitters over here. And the underlying um, basis of uh, chemical imbalance in, in um, depression is that there's less norepinephrine and there's less um, serotonin in, in people with depression. And so what happens is tricyclic antidepressants block this pump, so it basically increases the amount of time that this monoamines actually spend in the synaptic cleft. And as you've got more monoamines in the synaptic cleft, it, there's more chances of it binding to the receptors and more chances of activating those receptors and causing an effect and allevi alleviating the symptoms associated with depression. Um, and so you see over here, therapeutic uses are to actually lift depression, um, to actually treat people with bipolar disorders when they've got acute depressive syndromes and also with fibromyalgia syndrome. Right? Adverse effects is this. Because you've got an increase in norepinephrine, what happens is the norepinephrine increases not only in the CNS, but it also increases in the peripheral nervous system. And if you have an increase in norepinephrine levels in the um, peripheral nervous system, it can actually activate the sympathetic nervous system and cause dysrhythmia, tachycardia, um, and uh, um, AV block and um, again vent ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation, right? Um, so it can actually cause cardiac toxicity and um, and may lead to to death. Um, other common adverse effects is because of its effect on other receptors. So it causes um, sedation because it blocks histamine receptors, it causes orthostatic um, hypotension because it blocks alpha-1 adrenergic receptors, and it causes um, muscarinic um, anticholinergic receptors because it blocks the muscarinic uh, anticholinergic effects because it blocks the muscarinic um, receptors. And again, just to highlight that it there is a possibility of increase in suicide um, risk attempts during early treatment. So in terms of drug interactions, um, again, you don't want to actually have any interactions with any other anticholinergic um, effects because this TCAs also cause anticholinergic effects. You don't want any interactions with other drugs which um, stimulates the sympathetic nervous system because this drug also stimulates the um, uh, effects on the heart. You don't want uh, interactions with uh, an other antidepressants. So the monoamine oxidase inhibitor is another class of antidepressant. Um, and because antidepressants depress the CNS, you have to take care that there's no uh, interactions with other drugs that also cause depression of the central nervous system. Second um, group of drugs with an that are antidepressant depressants are SSRIs. So SSRI stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. So basically, these drugs work the same way as the TCAs, but the difference is this. With TCAs, you've got, um, it basically causes a blockage of the uh, norepinephrine going in, as well as the 5-HT reuptake. Whereas in um, SSRIs, what happens is it only blocks reuptake of 5-HT. And so what happens with this is the amount of 5-HT in the synaptic cleft increases. Um, and you can see over here, it's the most commonly prescribed antidepressant. The good thing with this is it does not have um, effects on um, most of the other receptors that um, TCAs have. So it doesn't cause hypotension, doesn't cause sedation, doesn't cause anticholinergic effects, right? Death by overdose is extremely rare. Um, and therapeutic uses are listed over here. So again, for depression, for bipolar disorders, um, for panic disorders, and for bulimia. So what happens is it inhibits, selectively inhibits serotonin reuptake to cause an increase in the levels of serotonin within the central nervous system synapses, and it also causes CNS excitation.
um, adverse effects, which can begin anywhere from 2 to 72 hours after um, treatment, is because it causes CNS excitation, it can cause these effects, right? And that's to do with CNS excitation. It can also cause withdrawal syndrome if it's uh, stopped abruptly. It can cause bleeding disorders. And so again, care needs to be used when a patient is also on other um, um, other drugs which can uh, which are antiplatelets or anticoagulants, which increase the risk of bleeding. Um, and then it can also cause uh, sexual dysfunction and weight gain. Um, and again, we see this weight gain associated with some of the atypical antipsychotics, and it's through the increase in uh, 5-HT. So again, drug interactions. So I explained the anti antiplatelets and anticoagulants. And again, monoamine oxidase inhibitors and tricyclic inhibitors are other classes of um, antidepressants, and so it increases the risk of what's called serotonin uh, syndrome. So this is the second class of antidepressants. Third class of antidepressants are called monoamine oxidase inhibitors, or MAOIs, right? MAOIs. And MAOIs are usually uh, given when um, the second of th or when they've already been tried on TCAs or SSRIs, and they're not successful. The reason behind why MAOIs are reserved until these other drugs have been tried is because the effects of MAOIs, the side effects, are more dangerous, right? It can trigger what's called a hypertensive crisis, which we'll talk about in the, um, in the next slide. So MAOI, basically, as I said, the monoamines are norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamines. And so what happens is MAOI um, convert monoamines, dopamine, 5-HT, and norepinephrine into inactive products. Right, And so if you inhibit this enzyme, what happens is the amounts of dopamine goes up, the amount of 5-HT goes up, and the amount of norepinephrine goes up, and it causes CNS excitation. The problem is that monoamine oxidase is also an enzyme that's used to inactivate tyramine. And so um, tyramine is found in certain foods, and we'll look at it um, later, later on. Um, and what happens is if tyramine is not inactivated by uh, monoamine oxidase, is it causes an increase in the release of norepinephrine. And we'll look at that, um, as I said, later on. So you've got um, just a graph over here. You've got, um, so what happens is neurotransmitter is released, acts on the receptor, and then it's pumped back up. It's being reuptaked into the neuron that releases it. And once it's, it's retaken up by the neuron that releases it, it can do one of two things. One is that it can, um, the enzyme monoamine oxidase can inactivate it. Or two is that if the monoamine oxidase inhibitor is, is inactivated, what happens is that neurotransmitter is repackaged into vesicles so that it can be re-released again and increase the amount of neurotransmitters in the synaptic cleft. Right? So if you look over here, that's what it does. It inhibits the mono amine oxidase uh, enzyme, and it's irreversible. So it lasts about two weeks um, until more monoamine oxidase enzyme can be made, right? So you can stop the MAOI today, and the effects will last for two weeks. Um, so depression, uh, therapeutic use, depression, adverse effects, because it lifts the depression, it can cause CNS stimulation. Right? And it can also cause uh, orthostatic um, hypotension, and it can cause hypertensive crisis that we'll see in the next slide. So again, some um, adverse effects are um, related to um, its mechanism of action, right? So because it can actually, um, because it increases the amount of norepinephrine around, you don't want to combine it with other sympathomimetic agents because that also will increase the release of norepinephrine and stimulate the sympathetic nervous system. Um, 
you don't want to inhibit the monoamine oxidase because then that will actually um, uh, contradict the effects of this drug. You don't want to combine it with other antidepressants because that would actually exacerbate the um, um, CNS stimulation or excitation. And because it causes orthostatic hypotension, you don't want to actually um, combine it um, without knowing with anti other antihypertensive drugs. All right, so the big deal with monoamine oxidase inhibitors is that it inhibits the monoamine oxidase. So over here, you've got um, a person eating um, tyramine-containing foods, and this is in the normal uh, patient, right? So no MA, MAOI. And so what happens is tyramine is ingested as part of the food, monoamine oxidase works, and it uh, metabolizes it to a metabolite that's not active, right? Um, and so what happens is if a person actually takes in monoamine oxidase inhibitors is that the tyramine actually remains unchanged. Um, and what happens is once it gets to the uh, terminals in the arterioles or hearts, or it can actually cause an increase in the release of norepinephrine. And norepinephrine, um, we know, causes vasoconstriction um, and increases blood pressure, and it also causes cardiovascular effects, right? So it can cause what's called a, a hypertensive uh, crisis, um, but it can also affect the heart to cause tachycardia, um, and it can also cause um, other uh, sympathomimetic effects like uh, um, profuse sweating, um, hypertension, headaches, um, and all that. So to prevent um, interactions with tyramine con uh, containing foods, patient teaching is very, very important, right? And if a person has a hypertensive uh, crisis, then some uh, ways to manage it is to actually um, induce vasodilation um, to reduce the hypertension um, and to actually um, reduce the effect on the heart. So these are just some foods that contain um, tyramine. You can see here you've got fruits, dairy products, alcohol, and processed meats, um, and also other foods to, uh, to avoid, uh, avoid, so chocolate, some sauces, and some vegetables. The next um, disorder we're going to look at is bipolar disorder. So in bipolar disorder, you've got this, you can have this fluctuating um, moods, right? So it's a cyclical disorders. So people can go for manic, from manic to uh, being severely depressed and then manic again. And um, sometimes these fluctuations of manic and um, depression can actually um, persist for months without treatment. So uh, someone can be in a depressed state for months or um, uh, or they can actually very quickly go up to be having a manic state. Um, and it really depends on the individual um, as to whether um, they're, they're safer or less harmful in the manic state, in the manic state or in the depressed state. Um, the underlying cause um, that um, clinicians think might um, underlie bipolar disorder is that there might be a disruption of neuronal growth and neuronal um, survival. So if there's a disruption in the growth of the neurons and the survival of the neurons, what the drugs do is they provide some protection of the neurons, so they're neuroprotective, and they also encourage growth of the neurons, so they're neurotropic. And we can see this in the um, drugs used to actually manage bipolar disorder. So um, the most successful treatment or management strategy for bipolar disorder is a combination of drug and non-drug therapy, right? So it's most effective for, most effective for long-term long -term therapy. And so you see over here, the drugs that are used are mood stabilizers, antipsychotics, and antidepressants, right? So mood stabilizers are used um, mainly to actually even out this uh, cyclical um, thing. So mood stabilizers help to keep the patient within a normal eurythmic um, um, levels. 
Um, and antipsychotics are used when when the patients are in acute manic state to actually bring that down to to normal um, moods. Antidepressants are obviously used to actually lift the patient's mood if they're in severe depression to actually again bring them to a level that um, they can actually um, have the highest possible uh, function. So promoting compliance, short-term hospitalization. Again, uh, people with uh, um, bipolar disorders are usually hospitalized when they're in acute manic or acute um, depressive state. And then you've got long-term therapy to actually prevent further uh, future recurrent um, episodes. And then again, education for both the family and the patient in order to actually manage um, the condition so that the uh, patient can have the uh, highest functional um, level possible for them. So again, education for the patient and family, very important. Psychotherapy, again, is also a good strategy for um, maintenance of um, a good state and then electroconvulsive therapy is usually used as a last result um, if um, there's a uh, um, a very severe acute um, episode that needs to be um, that needs to be resolved very very quickly one of the drugs of choice used for um, bipolar disorder is lithium there is a lot of problem with lithium but let's look at the good stuff so um, the presumed mechanism of action of lithium is that it, it uh, protects the neurons and it encourages neuronal gro growth, right? So that's a good thing. The uh, um, unfortunate thing about lithium is that there's a very, very low therapeutic index. So the therapeutic index needs to be kept within um, this um, range, and so that's a very, very small range. So anything above that will lead to toxic effects anything below that you have no therapeutic effects right so it needs to be kept within a very very tight uh, range and so again if a person is started on lithium it needs to be monitored every two to three days and then with blood tests every three to six months because it has a short half-life the doses are split during the day um, and because it's uh, um, because it's an inorganic iron, what happens is there's no antidote to lithium, but you can actually remove it with uh, dialysis. Excretion patterns of lithium um, follow sodium's excretions uh, pattern, and so you need to actually monitor sodium levels. So when plasma sodium levels are low, um, lithium excretion also decreases. Right, so again, you need to actually keep sodium levels at a normal level so that excretion of lithium are, is, is normal. And so you get the therapeutic effect and you don't get um, an accumulation of lithium which might lead to a toxic effects. Adverse effects are severe even at therapeutic levels. And that's also a problem because you have to actually convince someone um, who is uh, perhaps in a manic state to actually take lithium with all the um, therapeutic, uh, with all the adverse effects that it's associated with. So the most common ones are um, gastrointestinal upset, so that's dyspepsia, indigestion, uh, stomach upset, um, nausea and vomiting, um, and all that kind of stuff. And then you've got tremors as well. Polyurea, it uh, um, can be toxic to the kidney. It can cause hypothyroidism and goiter as a result of that. And um, for uh, pregnant women, it can cause, um, it can be a teratogen. So again, uh, need to actually um, ensure that the patient taking lithium is not pregnant. Um, signs of tox toxicity um, are listed over here. So drug interactions, um, we need to watch for a patient actually taking diuretics because what happens is with a person taking diuretics, they would actually um, um, cause an increase in sodium loss. And so you'd have more lithium uh, leaving the system and it's not going to be as effective. Um, anticholinergic drugs um, also may cause uh, gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, and also just uh, to watch out um, when used in combination with non-steroidal um, anti-inflammatory drugs. So this is the uh, drug of choice, but it's also been largely replaced by another drug that's listed over here, right? Because uh, valproic acid is much safer. Um, it has a higher TI, 
Um, so it's as effective as, as lithium with a higher therapeutic index, works much faster, and has less uh, side effects. All right, so as effective as lithium because the mechanism of action is, is the same. Um, valproic acid was actually developed as an anti-epileptic drug. Um, and the way that it treats, um, it manages bipolar disorder is that it's effective really when a person is in the manic state. Right, because as an anti-epileptic drug, what happens is it uh, is it calms down the neurons, and so if a person has an acute manic episode, its uh, valproic acid is able to actually um, resolve the symptoms associated with it. There are some serious toxicity effects, um, and they're listed over here. So you've got some um, some uh, common side effects, but again, they're not as severe as is the case with lithi lithium. Um, carbamazepine is uh, uh, also another anti-epileptic drug and again used to treat manic, um, acute manic episodes um, and um, it also, the thing with carbamazepine is it induces um, hepatic enzymes which accelerates uh, drug metabolism so again you need to actually maybe give a higher level of other drugs that are taken together with carbamazepine in order to ensure a ther therapeutic levels. And then the third anti-epileptic drug is listed over here, and this is usually given for long-term maintenance uh, therapy of bipolar disorders, right? Um, and um, this can be used alone or in combination with other mood-stabilizing agents. So the last group of, um, or the second last group of drugs are uh, CNS depressants. So CNS depressants are used primarily to treat anxiety and insomnia. Used to treat anxiety at low doses, used to treat insomnia at higher doses. And so these are also called anti-anxiety agents or anxiolytic. Two classes of CNS depressants, benzodiazepines um, and barbiturates. They're benzodiazepine-like like drugs, but we won't actually talk about this because they're very similar to the benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines have a lower potential for abuse, right? Produces less tolerance and physical uh, dependence, general safer than other general CNS depressants. Barbiturates are, um, were developed first, um, but they're not as commonly used now because it can actually, um, uh, it has a higher potential for abuse and um, it can actually lead to death um, if taken um, with an overdose. So we're going to look at that um, as we go along. So again, this is just a comparison of the effects of benzodiazepines to barbiturates. So you see here benzodiazepines relative safe, safety is high compared to barbiturates that has a low um, relative uh, safety margin. Right, and the reason why the safety um, of uh, relative safety of benzodiazepine is higher than barbiturates is because of this. Right, so it, it um, has a low suicide potential, low um, ability to depress respiration, as well as uh, CNS function, um, low ability to cause tolerance, physical dependence, and abuse, and doesn't really induce hepatic. Um, drug metabolism. Whereas you can see here in barbiturates, it's high, uh, um, high risk for all these factors. And the reason um, lies between the uh, um, ability of benzodiazepines to cause low risk of these factors versus barbiturates to cause high risk of these factors is found in this slide. So if you look over here, this is a chloride ion channel, right? So what happens is when this is open, what happens is chloride goes from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. And what happens to the membrane potential is say, usually the membrane potential is minus, minus 70 millivolts. What happens is that when chloride goes into the cell, the membrane potential drops. So it drops down here. Right? And when it drops down here, what happens is it's less able to reach threshold. And remember, threshold is the minimum amount for an action potential to actually happen. Right? So basically, it depresses the central nervous system right? when chloride actually enters into the cell. Um, 
So the reason why benzodiazepine and uh, barbiturates differ in its um, relative safety is this. Benzodiazepine receptors are actually found, oh sorry, both are actually found on cells that contain GABA receptors. And GABA receptors, so when GABA binds to this, what happens is the chloride ion channel opens and then chloride goes in. All right. Um, what happens is that um, the binding site for benzodiazepine is actually on a different site than the GABA receptor, right? So the benzodiazepine is an allosteric uh, modulator, and so once it binds, what happens is it increases the likelihood of GABA binding to this, to its receptor, and increases the likelihood of the, of the uh, chloride ion channel opening and chloride going in. All right, so um, that's what it does. So benzodiazepines work as long as GABA is present. So it only works really when GABA is present. Barbiturates work basically as an agonist, as a GABA agonist. So when when barbiturates bind to its binding site, it's as if GABA was actually binding to its um, receptor, and that causes the chloride um, ions to, to open. And so what happens is if you increase the levels of barbiturates, then you increase the amount of chloride going in, and you increase CNS depression. Right, so it, it does not have a sealing effect. Whereas benzodiazepines, because they need GABA to actually be present, it has what's called a sealing effect. And after it's reached that sealing, after all the GABA has been used, then there's um, it can't actually depress the CNS and depress respiration anymore. So benzodiazepines, you've got some examples over here. Um, mechanism of action, as it says here, increased effect of GABA at GABA uh, receptor, um, and it has a sealing effect. So chloride goes in, but only as long as GABA is present, right? So it reduces anxiety, promotes sleep, so it's anti-anxiety and um, used to uh, manage insomnia, and it weakly depresses this, uh, the respiratory system. All right, so you've got over here weak CNS depression, tolerance does developed to some effect, um, but physical dependence is low. Okay, In terms of drug interactions, because it does depress the CNS, you don't want to combine it with other CNS depression because that would actually increase the risk of resp respiratory depression as well as general CNS depression. Barbiturates, um, they're powerful respiratory dis depression, so much use much less because you've got, we've got benzodiazepines um, on the scene. Uh, barbiturates also induces hepatic uh, drug metabolizing enzymes, so it means that it increases the elimination rate of other drugs, and so those drugs might have to be given at a higher dose. You see over here what happens with um, barbiturate use. So tolerance does develop, right? Tolerance does develop, and so what happens over here is um, the dotted line is the desirable effects. So you see with tolerance, you need an increased amount of drug to have the same effect. So the, um, the minimum effective concentration increases over time, but you also have the dose needed to cause serious harm. And the serious harm is uh, respiratory depression um, and, and coma, right? And so eventually what would happen is tolerance would develop and eventually these two lines would actually meet. And it also means that um, a person can overdose on barbiturates and can actually um, die from it because it can cause a severe re respiratory depression. Last uh, group of drugs are CNS stimulants. So mechanism of action is it increases activity of all CNS neurons. Um, and it can cause convulsions if it's at high enough dose. There's very limited clinical applications for CNS stimulants. Um, antidepressants, you can see here the differences between antidepressants and general CNS stimulants is that antidepressants only affect those neurons 
um, that are um, not firing as well. Um, so it selectively elevates moods without causing general uh, CNS excitation at therapeutic doses, where CNS stimulants produce general CNS uh, uh, stimulation. So the only um, CNS stimulants we're going to talk about is um, Ritalin, right? Ritalin is very, very similar to amphetamine. So we're going to look at that. So with Ritalin, what happens Sorry, we're going to talk about amphetamine and then we're going to, to look at the similarities of amphetamines to Ritalin. So amphetamines increase the release of norepinephrine and dopamine and inhibit the reuptake of both. So what happens is it blocks this and it increases this process. So at the end of the day, you have an increase in norepinephrine and an increase in dopamine um, in the system. So it increases, it works to actually causes CNS excitation, but also because you have an increase in norepinephrine, you, it leads to a CNS effect, right? So um, you've got the possibility of cardiotoxic um, effects as well as hypertension. Now, the other thing is that because it causes an increase in dopamine, it can actually cause symptoms that are associated with schizophrenia, right? Because in schizophrenia, the chemical basis of schizophrenia is that there, there's too much dopamine, and amphetamines increase the amount of dopamine. So you can see over here, the adverse effects are really due to an increase in dopamine or an increase and an increase in norepinephrine, right? Some indications for amphetamines or a variation of amphetamines is ADHD and uh, narcolepsy, the tendency to, f to fall asleep. Um, because of a chemical um, imbalance. You can see over here tolerance to all effects does occur and physical dependence does also occur. Okay, so um, because physical dependence occur, you, um, when a person is on an amphetamine or an amphetamine-like drug, you need to actually withdraw slowly um, and to taper um, doses. And um, euphoric effects are high, um, so abuse potential is also very, very big. So um, one of the um, therapeutic uses for amphetamines or a variation of is um, ADHD. So again, with ADHD, what happens is that you've got a person who's um, inattentive, hyperactive, impulsive, fidgety, unable to concentrate, switches ex ex uh, excessively from one activity to the other, um, and in children, calls out excessively in, in, in class. Possible causes are dysregulation of pathways that use norepinephrine, 5-HD, and dopamine. So because it's dysregulation of pathways, what we think happens is that there's reduced 5-HT, reduced uh, norepinephrine, and reduced dopamine, right? And so the treatment is to give something that increases norepinephrine and dopamine um, levels by increasing its release or inhibiting the reuptake of both. So that's where Ritalin come in. So Ritalin has an almost identical profile to amphetamine. Um, the only thing with this is that Ritalin reduces the negative disruptive behavior. So reduces all these common signs and symptoms associated with ADHD. But you also need then um, other strategies to actually create positive behavior and to create good study skill. So sometimes cognitive behavioral therapy is, is needed in conjunction with Ritalin to actually ensure that the uh, child actually develops positive uh, habits um, and positive behavior. Um, long-term effects, long-term use of, of Ritalin does affect the child's retention to ability to retain information and it also causes because of its increase in norepinephrine in the in the uh, brain it causes ins insomnia it suppresses appetite and so you can imagine if a child doesn't eat it leads to growth suppression and so there's um, some clinicians who believe that drug holidays um, are good, just a break from the drugs either on the weekends or on breaks or during the summer to actually allow the child to actually regain their appetite and to actually um, um, allow the growth to um, off the height to actually happen. And they found out that if, um, you know, the, the drugs are stopped, 
that there is a rebound in the growth of the child's height. All right, so that's it for now, um, and I'll see you later.